Hi everyone, welcome to these Python tutorials where we are putting special focus on image processing related uh, tasks. Now in this tutorial, let's look at batch normalization and dropout. And if you haven't watched the last four or five videos where we are talking about various terminology as part of deep learning, I highly recommend you to go back and look at that because the goal is for me to train you such a way that when you look at a model that gets published on GitHub or wherever or on a paper, uh, I really hope that you understand every little terminology, okay, as part of that uh, as part of that uh, uh, code. Now, uh, here let's look at batch normalization and dropout. And uh, to be frank, batch normalization can be important uh, depending on the situation, but dropout is usually a very important thing to include as part of your network uh, and we'll see why okay so let's go ahead and look at uh, batch normalization and why is it used it's used for improving the speed performance and stability of training these these are pretty uh, cliche i think i should say in terms of uh, the terms but let's see exactly what uh, is the need for this now if you look at all of these different uh, features are not features uh, objects or images if you're a biologist you know that they're all probably at least this one is a mitochondria that one looks like the cross section of a mitochondria in a different angle same with this and believe it or not this is also a cross section of this now a model trained only on mitochondria with distinct features for example you train a model only with this it won't perform very well on uh, mitochondria with some features missing. Of course, we know that. And we need to generalize that, meaning you have to provide more training data. But in addition to that, there is this is this is because of the shift in input distribution. Like here, the input distribution, and from here, the input distribution, there is a shift in this input di distribution. Also, other example I can use is, okay, if you train a model uh, on a whole, whole bunch of red apples and all of a sudden you have a green apple, how do you generalize? How do you handle that shift in the distribution? This is called covariate shift, okay? And the covariate shift is the change in distribution of these covariates, okay? Meaning the uh, predictors are like these input variables. And batch normalization, basically it reduces this covariate shift. That's why you use batch normalization, okay? As part of your, uh, uh, as part of uh, your defining the network. Now, it's called batch because during the training, we normalize each layer's inputs, okay? Using the mean and variance of the values in that specific batch, okay? So again, during the training, the batch normalization, uh, it normalizes the layer's inputs Okay, by using the mean and variance of the values. That's it. So every time it updates this the ba uh, as, uh, as long as you have this batch normalization layer. That's it. Now, again, just to summarize the benefits of this, uh, we already saw what the problem is. The benefit here is faster overall training of the network because you're actually bringing all the values to, uh, to right there, right? Uh, to using the mean and variance, okay? Uh, so it makes the training a bit faster and enables higher learning rates. So you can actually work with uh, uh, higher learning rates with uh, batch normalization. Again, you can do a lot of experiments with your own data, but uh, this is the summary from, uh, from many sources there. Weight initialization uh, becomes a bit easier, apparently. Again, for each of these, uh, uh, you, can, you can do in-depth research in understanding why this is. But uh, weight initialization becomes easy and makes it easy to work with many activation functions, apparently, not just ReLU, but others and overall better results in most cases. I know this is very vague without giving a lot of uh, details, but batch normalization in general, all it's doing is doing this exact, sorry, right there, okay? Uh, using the mean and variance of that specific batch, it normalizes each layer's inputs, that's it. And the benefits is, as we just saw, these are the benefits. Now, the question is, if you're doing batch normalization, should you be scaling your data? Right, we talked about scaling. If you have images where the values go from zero to 255, you're dividing that by 255, or you have many types of scalers, right? Min, max, scalar, and others. So if you're doing scaling, why do you need batch normalization? Well, you still need to do that so that you ensure that the inputs of the first layer have a zero mean and have some uh, the same distribution, okay? This can be very helpful. But based on my personal experience, scaling is super important 
And then batch normalization is, uh, it gives you slightly better results or faster training, but then uh, it's not going to break anything. It's going to help or improve things, but scaling is the one that you have to absolutely pay attention to. Now, dropout is also one of the things where you have to pay a lot of attention. Why do we use dropout? To minimize overfitting. What is overfitting? The model works very well on training data, but not much on validation or testing data. So it's overfitting onto your training data. Now, how do you do dropout? Again, uh, this is also called regularization, right? I mean, how do, what do you mean by regularization? It generalizes the problem, uh, you know, your algorithm rather than overfitting it. So how does it work with neural networks? Uh, Again, uh, trained on relatively small data sets can overfit the training data, especially. Sometimes we think that, okay, I only have like 10 images with 20 objects. I can do augmentation, meaning I can kind of rotate the image, flip the image and stretch the image and do a few of these tricks and uh, get some training done. Yeah, of course it sounds like it's working, but the problem is it works only on those images. When you feed new images, it's probably not going to work very well, okay? So whenever you have relatively small data sets, you can overfit the data. So to minimize the overfitting, you need to train on a large number of network architectures and take the mean, right? So what you do is, oh, now I have like three hidden layers and then I would like to connect these. I would like to skip some connections and you can actually do uh, almost infinite number of these uh, models and then you kind of average them. That'd be best, that, that'd be amazing. But this is obviously not practical, especially uh, you know with these uh, deep neural networks. So one thing we can do is drop out approximates this training a large number of neural network with different architectures in parallel. That's what this uh, uh, th this kind of simulates in a way, or it, it approximates, like it says. Now, what, what does that mean? I'll talk about what dropout means in a minute, but uh, during training, some number of, I mean, I'll, I'll show you visually, but uh, uh, if you read the text, some number of layer outputs are randomly ignored or dropped. So when you're connecting these different layers, instead of connecting from every neuron to every other neuron, you can say drop 10% randomly. As simple as that, that's what dropout is. And it's implemented per layer in neural network. So every layer you are saying, okay, I want 10% dropped out in this layer, but then in the next one, 20%, okay? You can control that. And uh, apparently it doubles the number of iterations required to converge because you're dropping out certain connections, but the training time for each epoch is less because you don't have those connections, okay? Uh, so here is a good example. Again, the network is, uh, all of these are connected right here. Now here we are just saying, okay, don't connect any of the, some of these and then only connect some of these connections, that's it. You're just killing some of these neurons, that's it, as you're going through. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, dropout, and now uh, let's look at some of the uh, results, or at least one result here. Here, this is the learning curve with no scaling or batch normalization. In this example, no scaling is the result of this horrible behavior. And here with scaling, meaning I divided every pixel by 255 and added some dropout and you get very nice uh, training and validation right there. Okay, so um, let's jump into the code again, the same code that we used in the last uh, tutorial and then uh, try to understand this dropout uh, programmatically or using our uh, Python code. So let's jump in. Okay, so this is the same code, like I said, uh, from last uh, last tutorial. So in the last tutorial, we understood weight initialization. We looked at kernel using zeros and then hey normal, hey uniform, for example. Now here in this tutorial, let's look at dropout and batch normalization. And in the next one, apparently I'm planning to record one on one heart encoding and so on. Okay. So let's just look at dropout and batch normalization. Again, what is this uh, data set that we're going to work with? It's a CIFAR 10 data set, which you can directly import from Keras. And it has 60,000 small, tiny images of 32 by 32 pixels that belong to one of these 10 classes. Okay, so now let's go ahead and start running the code. And I'm using GPU because it takes time for this uh, for this to train. So if you're doing it on your local system with CPU only, this will take time. Okay, so CIFAR10 again from keras.datasets, we are importing this and we are unwrapping that uh, data into X train, Y train, X test, Y test. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, let's do 
yeah so we have 50,000 images of size 32 by 32 their color that's why number of channels is three okay um, now let's go ahead and look at a few of these images again here you have a horse and you have like a car and so on let's go ahead and scale the data again it's as simple as I'm converting my extra in values which go from 0 to 255 right these are 8 bit to float and then dividing everything by 255 so they should bring all the values to between 0 to 1 and uh, now let's convert our Y train to categorical in case you wonder what that means wait for the next tutorial obviously that's the plan for us to work with in the next tutorial okay so so far so good now let's start with a dropout of uh, zero let me define this model right i mean let's let's go through this model first in the last video we changed the kernel initializer from helium uh, helium hey uniform to zeros but let's let's use hey uniform this is the best one that works well with relu again going through each term you understand convolution you understand activation kernel initialization padding I think you understand pretty much everything here so far, including the activation here. You know what stochastic gradient descent is. You know what uh, RMS prop is another, another, we looked at Adam, but this is another one, another optimizer. And you understand all of these. So the only thing we are changing here is drop. You see, I defined a convolution layer and then max pooling layer, and then I am defining a dropout. And I'm saying at this point, dropout all, zero. I mean, you can, you can basically say drop zero here, but 10% here and 20% here. It's up to you. In this example, I'm just defining all the same. So it's easy for us to demonstrate this. Basically, this means don't drop out anything. When I say drop out equals to zero. So let's see how things look like if I don't drop out. Okay, so let's run this. So we're not doing any drop out, meaning all uh, the neurons here and all the neurons here are fully connected. Okay, same thing down here everything is fully connected so we ran that line let's ignore this and let's go ahead and fit the model for 25 epochs okay so as i did in the last time i'll go ahead and pause the video and then continue as soon as the training is done okay so it's done and before we look at the result just think about why we are doing dropout why do we need dropout so the model doesn't overfit what does that mean that means our model does equally well on the validation data as it does on the training data right so now let's look at our accuracy on the training data it's actually going up very nicely you see all the way to 99.97 percent that's great yeah and how did our validation accuracy do it actually started going up like 0.69 but then it's kind of jumping around 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, it's not improving. This is not as close to, or this is exactly what we mean by overfitting. It does great on training accuracy, but bad on validation accuracy. Let's, we can look at that graphically. Let's go ahead and plot it. So if you look at the plot, isn't that horrible? I mean, look how the loss is going uh, down for training, but then the loss is actually increasing for validation after a certain time. That's because, again, the model is doing much better on training compared to the validation. It can also be seen in terms of your uh, your accuracy, right? Uh, validation accuracy saturated at uh, right there, but training accuracy keeps improving. Now let's change the dropout to 0.2, like 20%, and see if that fits, uh, if that makes any difference. Okay, so let's go back here and change this to 0. Point, let's change it to 25%, and runtime, restart, run, and run all. So let's look at the result as soon as this is done. So let's go down all the way and wait for our graphs to show up right around here okay so i'll pause this video and hopefully something will show up uh, in the next uh, 40 to 40 seconds to one minute now you can see both the training and validation curves are going down pretty much uh, almost together and this is pretty ideal in a couple of tutorials i'm going to talk about uh, these training and validation curves so you know how to interpret them as soon as you see them but i think you already got an idea on how to sm uh, spot overfitting and here uh, both of these are doing uh, 
pretty good over there so now you see the importance of uh, importance of dropout especially now if you would like to include batch normalization for example you can go ahead and include batch normalization uh, you know uh, some right in the middle one uh, a couple of batch normalizations which I did and it doesn't make uh, a visible difference in your result so I'm not going to demonstrate that but I'll let you explore that I'm going to share this code anyway please look at the description okay so in the next video let's uh, talk about one hot encoding which is very important if you're interested in multi-class classification using deep neural networks so until then again please do not forget to subscribe to this channel thank you